Well, if you brought your Bibles, you can open up to uh, First Timothy. I told the Lord, no more grow up messages. We've got all these grow up messages. Let's do something fun. Today we're going to talk about the grace of God. We're talking about the fact God wants every day to be a happy day for you. And that kind of stretches our minds because it isn't the paradigm the world sets out. They just figure Monday through Friday is stressed, maybe a little ease on the weekend. But you know, God wants tomorrow to be a happy day for you. Now look what Paul talks about in 1 Timothy 1, 12 to 14. I thank Christ Jesus our Lord who has strengthened me because he considered me faithful putting me into service. Even though I was formerly a blasphemer, a persecutor, and a violent aggressor, yet I was shown mercy because I acted ignorantly in unbelief. And the grace of our Lord was more than abundant with the faith that are in Christ Jesus. You know, Paul looked like the least likely prospect in the first century to be a preacher. I mean, he was killing Christians. He was hurting believers. He was doing it all wrong in all his pride about Phariseeism. And yet, God saw beyond the outer and looked at his heart and saw a heart that was after God. Look at verse 12, what it says. What did the grace of God do for him? It says he strengthened me. The first thing that the grace of God will do for you is strengthen you. And the second thing, if you look in verse 13, even though I was formerly a blasphemer and a persecutor, the grace of God caused him to be seen in a favorable light. God wants us, you know, I just got to saying, he wants every day to be a happy day. Do you know you can't have a happy day if you're feeling guilty? No. Try to feel guilty and be happy. You can't. It is an absolute joy robber. And, and he is, what the grace of God does, he looks at you, and it's not that he doesn't see your fault, but he sees who you want to be and who you're capable of being and who you are in the blood. And he looks at them and says, he looks at you and says, I find a fault in you. He sees you righteous. So we're going to see that. But what I want to talk to you about, you say it's not a grow-up message, but it is a grow-up message. All messages are grow-up messages. Mm -hmm. We're in the process of growing up. But he wants us to treat other people with the same grace that he gives to us. And I don't know what kind of grace you've received, but I have received astronomical grace to be here this morning. Amen. Just amazing. And I think in a way that's where this message came from. I came to Spanish service a little early the other night. I don't have to do anything for Spanish service, but come and be blessed. It's so wonderful. It's just wonderful. Lisa preached. It was excellent. And I was there a few minutes early, and I looked around. And how many know that no matter what horizon you're looking at, there's always going to be a blip on it. There's always going to be a potential obstacle. I'm thinking of potential obstacles. I'm thinking about two things that I'm not sure how we're going to get past. And the Lord said, lift up your eyes and look at the grace of God. And I looked and I saw a lot of people coming in. I've known them for 20 years. Great friendship. Wonderful people. I looked at the building. He said, how'd you get? To? Oh, it's the grace of God that got us this building in this little town. Believe me, the grace of God. And he said, if I brought you all this far, through all these years, through grace, and your friendships are still standing, and the people still love each other, and the building's still strong, and I'm still here, why am I not going to bring you the rest of the way by the grace of God? Amen. And that's what we're going to look at today. Hallelujah, the role of grace. The role of grace of God in our lives is so massive, it's actually hard to define. I'm going to give you a couple of shots at it here, and then we'll look at some more scripture. The grace of God is God bestowing on mankind all the good things we need but don't deserve. With the emphasis on don't deserve. If you deserve it, it's not grace, it's wages. But it's not just, it's not, it wouldn't be, wouldn't deserve this building. Well, you don't deserve the great people in your life. You've had people in your life better than what you deserve. I know I do. Hallelujah. Grace is not just for sin. There is grace for sin. You get when you get a sin, but you know, that doesn't make us want to sin, because even if you get grace, sin has done some destruction. Sin is destructive. So you don't want to go there, okay? But grace is not just for sin. It's for any lack or any deficiency we encounter in doing the will of God for our lives. Now, you can say, what if I'm not really doing the will of God for my life? You can still get grace. But the phenomenal grace is when you start to really pursue the will of God. 
because then your purposes are in, in line with God's purposes. There's nothing Satan can throw at you to thwart the purpose of God in your life if you're all out for it. Grace is when the Lord comes up with solutions that we could never dream up in a million years. Thursday morning, I was praying. I pray for you guys, believe it or not, especially if I know somebody's going through something. I was praying for two people in particular. And for the life of me, I could not give the Lord a good suggestion on how to fix the problem. What do you know? It's a separate problem. And I'm sitting there trying to come up with a suggestion for the Lord. I thought, you know, I could have faith for this if I could just suggest a good way, but I can't even. I got a message and a phone call within an hour. The phone call was a phenomenal suggestion from God of how he might be able to fix something. And then I got a text message. I thought, that's too good to be true. I would never have thought that. And then I went off praying about something else. The grace of God comes up with divine ingenuity. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Grace is when you make a mistake and pray. And the Lord turns the tables on the devil and makes it better than if it never happened. You say, that can't happen. I've seen it happen so many times. You made a mistake. And instead of punishing you for it, he said, if you'll, if you'll pretend, I'll make it better than if it didn't happen. Now, how, what kind of God do we serve? Hallelujah. Grace is when the day is long and yet somehow you're not weary. Grace is when somebody's tried your patience to the breaking point and then this, all of a sudden you see them in a new light. And you can show them kindness because you see them the way the Lord sees them. Grace is the Lord kindly giving us his worldview in a situation. And suddenly everything becomes clear and it becomes doable instead of impossible. That is the grace of God. Now, if you can access the grace of God this morning against the most stubborn obstacle. What is the most stubborn obstacle you're facing? The one that you don't even think. The, the name of this morning's sermon, or sermon is, Is Your God Adequate? Now, if you, I ask you that in the hallway, you're going to say, oh, yes, Pastor, we're going to say, oh, yes. And then there's just this one thing that just about got our faith stumped, all right? Wow. If you can access the grace of God this morning against that one thing, your most stubborn obstacle, you will be home free. Now, if you, if you go to 1 Corinthians 15.10, we're actually going to go to the Old Testament in a minute, but I want to read you this statement about grace in the Old Testament. The role of grace in the believer's life in the Old Testament is totally different than in the New Testament. Because the Old Testament saints, they just had to kind of struggle along the best they could. If you, how many of you have an actual paper Bible, physical Bible? You know, okay. Two thirds of those pages are Old Testament, and yet only nine times does the word grace appear in the Old Testament. It just wasn't a huge factor in their lives. Do you know how many times the word, look at, if you take Matthew, to Revelation, in those few books, 135 times, a little few more than 135 times, the word grace is used. That's a lot of times. Paul uses grace three times in one verse. Why don't you read it with me? But by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace toward me did not prove vain, but I labored even more than all of them, yet not I, but the grace of God with me. Now that is a mouthful. We're going to look at the three times he uses the word grace. The word, um, everything that we are. Here, the first time it says, by the grace of God I am what I am. Everything that we are that is good is by the grace of God. You don't have to have written two-thirds of the books of the New Testament like Paul did to say I am what I am by the grace of God. Okay, and you say, well, you know, I'm pretty wonderful. That's good. <laughs> <laughs> Any wonderful in me came from Jesus. I was a sarcastic, spiteful, scissor mouth, make you confetti if I'm upset with you. <sighs> Proud of it? No. But I'm here to tell you if you are wiser, more joyful, more compassionate, and you radiate the peace of heaven this morning, it's by the grace of God. I mean, if you can say that, it's by His grace. Hallelujah. <laughs> Now, the second time he uses the word grace, by the grace of God, I am what I am, and his grace toward me did not prove vain. Now, this begs the question, could the Lord show all kinds of mercy and favor in the life of believer and that believer squander it? Have you ever seen somebody go out and mess up and God is so merciful to them and they just squander it instead so of using some for the kingdom of God? Paul said, I did receive mammoth grace, but I didn't squander it. 
the grace. This is an important point. I mean, has anybody had God be so good to you and embarrassed you? It just brought you to tears because you should have been spanked and he just lifted you up instead and was okay. He said, but the grace, his grace toward me did not prove vain. Paul said, I used that grace. I used it for the kingdom of God. And then the third place it says, I labored even more than all of them, yet not I but the grace of God with me. Paul said, I did not use God's grace as an excuse not to do my part. And we're not saying God's grace is going to cover everything, so just go to work a couple days this week, no. Or, you know, treating people the way you want to. No, God's, Paul said, his grace did not prove vain. I labored with it. I did every single thing I could. And then when I look back, I realized the reason I went so far was because his grace was laboring with me. Isn't that awesome? Because it's lonely. This world can be lonely. You can feel like the whole world's against you some days. But he says, you're never alone because my grace is laboring with you. Amen. When the Lord says in Psalm 46, God is a very present help in time of trouble. Remember this? God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. When they, the translators, go to translate a verse. Okay, if I'm listening to an interpreter in Spanish, there's always a, almost always a couple of ways you could interpret. You try to choose the best. They were talking, I was going to say arguing, discussing how to translate this verse. And some of the translators had an alternate translation, and they put it in the margin. It says, God is our re refuge and strength, abundantly available for help in tight places. Abundantly, I spelled that wrong. I did the typing my very own self. Sorry about that. I'm sure it's, it's supposed to say abundantly available for help in tight places. That, I like that because trouble... I think, well, I don't know if I'm exactly in trouble this morning. Oh, I'm in a tight place in a couple of places. Amen. You know what a tight place is? It's where you're not sure what to do. He's abundantly available for help in tight places. Yeah. Now, we want to go to the Old Testament. If you go back to Ezra, we're going to just spend a few minutes. Because anything, okay, Americans, I heard somebody say on a political program last night, America is Disney World. 6% of the world's population lives in America. And, if, and to the rest of the world, we live in Disney World. We live in a place that almost always has electricity, almost always has running water, wow. almost always has a variety of food where we have to worry about diets instead of whether we're going to starve. Right. We live in this tremendous, wonderful place. And I remember I took Christiana, we took Christiana to Guatemala when she was 10. And I love her, you know how wonderful. She's, how many of Christiana fans? The whole world's Christiana fans. <laughs> I'm a single mom. And she brought me her Christmas year in 2003. It's Christmas list. And I, thought, and I told her, I said, honey, if we sell the house, we can do it. <laughs> how is that wrong? How had she been raised? She had been raised where every commercial told her the greatest thing she surely should have. I mean, we, we, we have it ingrained in us. And I thought the only possible way for her to have any comprehension is to go. And so they, she wasn't enough to go on a youth trip. I'm trying to make this short. But the next year we took on a shoebox campaign where we gave out gifts. And just from the airport to the Living Water campus, we saw houses with corrugated tin roofs, sort of the sides, no wall, no windows, no doors, and the chickens and pigs running in and out. And that was their home. And she kept elbowing me. She said, they don't live there, do they? I said, yes, we are. That's her house. Just from the airport the Living Water Campus, you know that you get an education that we are ridiculously blessed. Come on. You're ridiculously blessed. Go home and look at all the comforts and say, I am ridiculously blessed. If my bed isn't soft enough, I get a mattress topper. I mean, we're ridiculously blessed. Okay, now why did I tell you all of that? Because in the New Testament, we take grace so for granted. We should celebrate the grace of God every day. They didn't have it in the Old Testament. And when they messed up, we're going to look at Ezra, just a few minutes here, just to see how they cherish this. Is, he says in this passage, you've given us this brief moment of grace. And the way they got in such a mess is they served the devil, literally. They threw their children, their firstborn, to idols and heard them fall, you know, die in a fire, screaming while they were dying in the fire. We read a few weeks ago, just 
to remember about the mercy of God that a king named Manasseh took his firstborn son, offered it to the God of Moab, and that God is a stone pit like this with the fire, and you take your firstborn. That little baby's name should be in Matthew 1 in the genealogy of, of, of Jesus. And instead he was sacrificed to Satan. Now if you're God, I don't know what you'd have a hard time forgiving. I would have a hard time forgiving that. And because, and listen, out of the goodness of God, out of the grace of God, he sent them into captivity. Do you know why? Because for all these generations, they couldn't get it straight who was God. They couldn't become monotheistic. And he permitted King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon to come in, just wipe out the city of Jerusalem and the temple. He took some captives back. You know, Daniel, Shananiah, you know, as Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego are their Hebrew names, like or their Babylonian names. But they took them back, and after 70 awful years of being slaves in Babylon, he said, okay, let's try going home now, okay? And he put it in a king's heart. I'm going to read in a minute. The Cyrus, he said, oh, you're a pagan king, but I want you to rebuild Jerusalem. Yeah. Now, what is it you think God can't do? Right. If God can tell a pagan king, I want you to rebuild Jerusalem and fund it. Woo. Okay, so we're, let's start reading. The, we're going to start right in the middle of everything where Ezra is praying over the foundation of the temple. But at the evening offering, I, Ezra, arose from my humiliation, even with my garment and my robe torn. And I fell on my knees and stretched out my hands to the Lord my God. And I said, oh my God, I am ashamed and embarrassed to lift up my face to you, my God. For our iniquities have risen above our heads, and our guilt has grown even to the heavens. Since the days of our fathers, to this day we have been in great guilt. And on account of our iniquities, we, our kings, our priests, have been given into the hand of the kings of the land, to the sword, to the captivity, to the plunder, to open shame as it is this day. But now, read this with me, but now for a brief moment, Grace has been shown from the Lord our God to leave us an escaped remnant and to give us a peg in the holy place that our God may enlighten our eyes and grant us a little reviving in our bondage. For we are slaves, yet in our bondage our God has not forsaken us but has extended loving kindness to us in the sight of the kings of Persia to give us reviving to raise up the house of our God and to restore its ruins, and to give us the wall in Judah and Jerusalem. And here's my point. They have lived 70 years not hearing from God, just so alone. And, but for a brief moment, grace was extended. Do you want to go back and just spend five minutes looking at this story? It is such a cool story. How, look at Ezra 1, 1 to 4. Here they are in a pagan land. Everything's been plundered. Now in the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, in order to fulfill the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah, the Lord stirred up the spirit of Cyrus, king of Persia, so that he sent a proclamation throughout all the kingdom, and also put it in writing, saying, Thus says Cyrus, king of Persia, The Lord, the God of heaven, has given me all the kingdoms of the earth, and he has appointed me to build him a house in Jerusalem, which is in Judah. This is not a Hebrew and not a server of Yahweh. Okay? Mm -hmm. Whoever there is among you of all his people, may his God be with him. Let them go up to Jerusalem, which is in Judah, and rebuild the house of the Lord, the God of Israel. He is the God who is in Jerusalem. Every survivor, whatever place he may live, let the men of that place support him with silver and gold, with goods and cattle, together with a free will offering for the house of God, which is in Jerusalem. Well, we do call this a moment of grace. When the king gets on board and says, go back, repopulate Israel, build the temple. I don't know if I include it in the scriptures that I gave back there, but they had 5,400 vessels from the temple of gold and silver, which Nebuchadnezzar had plundered and cataloged, put in storage, and he made them get them all out. Now, then a problem arises. You're going to be traveling in a caravan carrying 5,400 valuable pieces of gold. This is an example of God speaking to a king and ordering the impossible. Who wouldn't have faith for that? You wouldn't have had faith for that if he had been alive at that time. Now they have another problem. He, they have to transport all the gold and silver. There's no 911, there's no cell phones, there's no police out there. There's just you and the bandits, okay? Now watch the next part. I left you then because I want you to think about the different kinds of grace. Ezra 7, 6 and 10. Then Ezra went up from Babylon, and he was a scribe skilled in the law of Moses, which the Lord God of Israel had given. And the king granted him all that he requested because of the hand of the Lord his God upon him. 
<coughs> for Ezra had set his heart to study the law and to practice it and to teach the statutes and ordinances. I don't know why I put that in there except that I liked it. <laughs> Do you know why? Amen. Because we're going to see that the word, grace comes through studying the Word of God. Amen. Grace comes from, okay, the next chapter is all we're going to read in Ezra. It's just three verses, but I love this. You'll see a different facet of grace. Then I proclaimed a fast there at the river Ahava that we might humble ourselves before our God to seek from him a safe journey for us, our little ones, and all our possessions. Now, I love this. Watch this. I was ashamed to request from the king troops and horsemen. Could he have? Yes. He could have said, just give us an armed escort with all this gold. I was ashamed to, to ask him to protect us from the enemy on the way because we had said to the king, the hand of our God is favorably disposed to all those who seek him, but his power and his anger against all those who forsake him. So we fasted and sought our God concerning this matter, and he listened to our entreaty. That, look at this. For the sake of their testimony, they had just told this king that didn't know anything about God. Don't worry about us. We'll be fine. Our God takes care of us. And then all of a sudden, they're faced with this journey with wild animals and bandits and a lot of valuable stuff. For the sake of their testimony, they sought the Lord and said, you're going to have to protect us because it's embarrassing to go back and tell him that you can't. And he says, now watch this. This is grace for protection. You can seek God for whatever. Grace is a substance that is so supernatural coming from God that when it hits you, you can hit it, feel it, hit your spirit, and it will morph into whatever you need God to be in your life. It's powerful. Hallelujah. So I just want to show you that little bit from the Old Testament. They treasured that grace because it was just for a brief moment. You and I woke up this morning under an empty, an empty open heaven. And the Bible says in Ephesians that grace has just been lavished, lavished on us. Yeah. You ever go on a vacation and instead of putting your little quarter of a pound of butter on because you're always watching your weight, you're on vacation and you lavish the butter on us. <laughs> uh, um, that's the way grace is. Hey, how many of you would lavish if there were no calories in butter? You just, oh my. Oh yes. I, I, I'm sure in heaven there's no calories in butter. <laughs> But the good news is that even if we can't have lavish butter now, we have lavish grace. Go to Ephesians. We're going to first do all, we just looked at how, what it was like in the Old Testament. Now we're going to look at what it's like in the New Testament. Ephesians 1, 3 to 6. Some of these things, I oh, know we've heard it before. We just need to ask God to let us hear it for the first time. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. Now you say, what is a spiritual blessing worth? Nothing until you get it down here, but it's there so you can get it down here. <laughs> Just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we would be holy and blameless before him. Pause. I'm not going to ask for a show of hands. Don't raise your hand. But how many of you feel holy and blameless before him? I'm going to tell you something. If you're living for God, and you're repented of, and you've told him sorry for things that you know he convicted you of, in his sight you are holy and blameless. And I'll, something else I just have to throw in here, if you want miracles in your life, you have to let you see yourself as holy and blameless, and you have to treat the people around you as holy and blameless. You say, they're not holy and blameless. That's because you're looking at them after the flesh. Jesus is not looking at you after the flesh in this verse. He's looking at you through the blood. Okay, in love, on to the next verse, in love he predestined the adoption as sons through Jesus Christ according to the kind intention of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace, which he freely bestowed on us. So in this verse it says, you have had grace freely bestowed on your life. How many of you think that? I've seen occasions where I was super aware of the fact that grace has been freely bestowed. The other thing to notice in that verse, his grace is glorious. When you learn to walk in it, there's literally a glory about his grace. Next verse. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the what? Riches of his grace. We're not talking a little dabble, do you, one brief moment. We're talking riches of his grace, freely bestowed. Watch this one. The grace which he lavished on us, and all wisdom and insight he made known to us. Hallelujah. We made a stop there, that's okay. 
He lavished grace on us. On top of all that, you and I have a standing invitation to go to the throne of grace to receive mercy and find grace to help. The Lord says, come get you some. It's right here. Come to the throne of grace. You can get mercy. How many of you usually renew mercy? Or how many turn in a perfect week? We'd like to give you a round of applause. Everybody turn in a perfect week. How many of you, when you go to the throne of grace, the first thing you ask for is some mercy? But it doesn't stop. They stop with mercy. As Hebrews 4, 16, I can give to you later in the lesson. He says, you come boldly. This grace has been purchased. Come boldly to the throne of grace that you may receive mercy and find grace to help. Now, everybody listen. How many of you say grace has been lavished upon me? I read it and I believe it. Now I ask you this. Do you lavish grace on your brothers and sisters? Do you lavish grace on the people you live with? And you say, why do you keep hitting this? I'll tell you why. God has called this church to miracles. We're already seeing miracles. We see miracles. We send out a prayer alert and there's the praise report. I mean, we've got, okay. You will not see miracles that you so desperately want until you learn to lavish grace on people that absolutely don't deserve it. Now, you know, I'd like to tell you, six out of seven days a week, I deserve it. No, I don't. Six out of seven days a week, I don't deserve lavish grace. But if you want, we're going to talk about how, how many of you ever notice that some Christians flow in a lot more grace than others? How many of you know that there's no lottery this morning in heaven to see who got the grace today? Not about lottery, okay? We'll get there in a minute. We are supposed to be generous with our favor and kindness because this is the era of lavish grace. And they got real quiet. I knew that. But why would I tell you about how wonderful grace is and not tell you how to flow it? I wanted to, when I started studying this yesterday, I wanted to stop everything I'm doing to stop the flow of grace in my life, and I'm going to start doing everything that causes it. He said he has lavished his grace on us. And look at what Jesus said. This is a principle in Matthew 10, 8. He said, heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse the lepers, and cast out demons. Why? Freely receive, freely give. This is the motto of heaven. Freely you receive, freely give. If you've got a ton of money and you know your brother's hurting and you don't want to give them a little to help them out, there is something wrong with that. You say, why? Because Jesus said freely you receive. Boy, I got why I'm asking you for money. I don't need any money. You know why I don't need any money? I'm generous. Amen. And you say that's rude. No, I'm telling you the truth. I'm generous. Amen. I've given people five hundred dollars. I've given people a thousand dollars. Don't line up on the way out. I do it by the <laughs> And you say, but why would you do that? Why would you why would you do that? Because I get more joy of relieving their burden than I do and what something I find with it. I love God and I found out that if you will be generous, everything in the Proverbs says the generous man will himself be watered. You'll be taken care of if you're generous. People don't believe that because people want to live in this world. Right there. We're aware of this world. We're not aware of this world. In this world, God has lavished so much grace on you. It's crazy. The angels just stand and shake their head. It says, these are things into which angels long to look. They can't even fathom how he loves us so much. Amen. But if you're going to say, guess what? I'm a child of God and grace has been lavished on me. And you want to continue to enjoy moment by moment of that lavish grace. You're going to have to start lavishing some grace on the people that get under your skin. And I'm, I'm telling you how to live a really happy life. Because the truth of the matter is, you will never have a totally happy day feeling guilty. And they will never let you have a totally happy day the way you're treating them now. So, no, I don't know that. I'm guessing. I'm just guessing it might apply to somebody, okay? The truth is, Jesus said, freely you receive, freely give. That applies to grace as much as it does money. It does apply to money. I know people think, you're crazy. I learned it from Brother Mark more than anybody. If you've never heard Mark Kankins, you're in for a treat in, in April. But we're supposed to be generous with our money. Right. Uh, we don't have to go to Acts chapter 4 where we completely live communally and throw it all in one pot. But our hearts should be for each other. Okay? And, and, okay, speaking of Acts chapter 4, let's know where the next scripture is. Wait, it's quiet. Have you ever mentioned money? Um, 
Did you know the Bible says there's a grace for giving? There's two whole chapters written on the grace for giving. You'll read it later. 2 Corinthians chapter 8, 2 Corinthians chapter 9. Paul talks about the grace that the Corinthian church had when, when the people in Judea were, were in a famine. Now, I don't know about you, but you see, a lot of people say, I want the grace to get rich. I don't want the grace for giving. They go together. I have that in my notes, but I'm just telling you, it's the way it works. Look at what it says about grace in this verse. And with great power, this is the early church right after it was born, with great power, the apostles were giving testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. And abundant grace was upon them all. Abundant grace. You know, there's, a, there's grace on this church. There can be more. Abundant grace, okay? Three ways to limit God's grace in your life. How would you like to know this? Because you don't want to limit it, okay? Number one. Cut yourself off from the source of grace. And number two, cut others off from receiving the flow of divine grace through you. And you say, you would just have to hit that, don't you? Yep. Yep. I'll tell you why. Why should he lavish 20 more tons of grace on you if you can't be gracious to your mom or to your kid? If he's lavished, you get up in the morning and he just lavishes his love on you, spill it over a little bit. They could use it. Well, it's quiet. Number one, a way to limit God's grace is cut yourself off from the source of grace. Number two, cut others off from receiving grace. Or number three, operate in pride instead of humility. People get really less than optimally happy when you announce you're going to speak on humility. But you know, humility is one of your dearest friends. It's one of your greatest allies. Yeah. Pride, it took Satan from being Lucifer, the leader of heaven's worship, to the bottomless pit. He will burn forever because of pride. I will ascend. We need to hate pride with everything in us. Amen. Uh, God says I, he's opposed to the proud and gives grace to the humble. Okay, we've only got 20 minutes. We better hurry. Psalm 45 in the Old Testament tells us where grace comes from. This is prophetic of Jesus. My heart overflows with a good thing. I address my verses to the king. Is king capitalized there? Yes? It speaks of Messiah, right? My tongue is the pen of a ready writer. You are fairer than sons of men. How many believe that applies to Jesus? Jesus is fairer than sons of men. What is poured through his lips? Okay. Okay. What is grace good for? It's good for anything in the world you need from God at that moment. When grace hits your heart, it hits you. grace to forgive, grace to believe, grace to receive healing. Are you following me? Where does grace come from? It comes through his lips. That means that if you don't read your Bible, you're not going to have as much grace. I'm not saying if you're a believer, you can't access some. Out on the highway, you're in a desperate, you may access some. But you won't have as much grace as if you're reading the Word and listen to the Holy Spirit. Because through the lips of the Holy Spirit and the lips of Jesus comes grace. Okay? And you say, do you have confirmation on that? Yeah, turn in your Bibles to Luke chapter 4, the very first time you ever preached in his hometown. I'm just going to read this thing. I, I may forget. Grace is a real spiritual substance. It's part of God's divine nature. And when grace hits your life, it becomes what you need. I think I said it, but it doesn't hurt to hear it again. Grace for healing, protection, forgiveness, the grace to pay your bills, the grace to bear up under a different, a difficult situation of class. Amen. They all come from God. Look at this. Here's your confirmation on whether grace comes through Jesus' lips. He came to Nazareth where he'd been brought up, and as was his custom, he entered the synagogue on the Sabbath and stood up to read. Uh, got any more? The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He sent me to proclaim liberty, release to the captives, recovery, sight of the blind, to set free those who are oppressed, and to proclaim the favorable year of the Lord. That word favorable can be translated the year of his grace or his favor. He closed his book, gave it back to the attendants, sat down in the eyes of all in the synagogue were fixed on him. And he began to say to them, today this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. Now watch what they say. All were speaking well of him and wondering at the gracious words. They wondered at the words of grace that fell from his lips, saying, Is this, isn't this Joseph's son? How did they know that the words he was speaking were full of grace? Because they felt it when they hit they their heart. When a word of grace from God hits your heart, how many of you have ever felt contempt at your heart when somebody talked down to you? 
I mean, or rejection. Somebody you thought liked you said something really mean, it just, oh. Well, when God's grace hits your heart, it, it's, oh, but it's in a good way, the opposite way. They felt the grace in the words. You can feel mercy, joy, strength come from grace. I'm going to say it a thousand times, but grace is a real spiritual substance. I don't have much water up here with me today. But, you know, you see, you barely see the water. You believe it's real because you can see it. If you look here, you can feel it. If you taste it, you can taste it. But grace, if you could look into the spiritual world, is every bit as real a substance. We're not talking about lavishing an invisible nothing. We're lavishing grace to where you can have help in every area of a day if you accessed it. Hallelujah. Second Corinthians 12, 9, a very familiar scripture. The Lord said to Paul, my grace is sufficient for you. I want you to know no matter which category you have this one thing in that even God couldn't fix it. God set me straight on that this week. Two things I could not even suggest how to fix. And he fixed them in two, two, a phone call and a text. The Lord said to Paul, my grace is sufficient for you. For, and if somebody is saying, you don't know what I've been through. You don't know how bad they hurt me. You, let's just read it. My grace is sufficient for you. For my power is perfected in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, I will rather boast about my weaknesses so that the power of Christ may dwell in me. Paul said, I don't mind talking about my own inabilities, shortcomings, and weaknesses because it authorizes him to show out in all his strength and glory. We read at the very beginning in 1 Timothy 1.14, his grace was more than abundant. And I can almost hear some of you thinking, I don't know what that means, his grace is more than abundant. Can I give you some practical applications and illustrations of the grace of God in Paul's life? When he was trapped in Damascus, they made a pact that they wouldn't eat or drink until they killed him. There was one gate out of the city, and they, they had a guards against it day and night to kill him. Now, what do you do? You don't helicopter out. Some, you know what the grace of God did? It gave somebody the ingenious idea of letting him down in a basket. Fortunately, he was a small man, and he went down. He said, that's not the grace of God. Sure it was. He lived to preach another day. When he was stoned and left for dead in Acts 15, God gave him the grace to stand the back up and shake it off. Now, that's not grace. They just said, yep, yeah, he's dead. And you get back. You say, I don't want that kind of grace. Well, if he can have this kind of grace, you can probably get what you need. If you have this, therefore, it is. Oh, I gave you the wrong chapter. It's Acts 14. I did it. Well, anyhow, we won't go back and find it. Do you understand? Here's a man who was ship, shipwrecked four times. It says three times, but that was before the one in Acts 27. He's shipwrecked four times. Have you ever been shipwrecked? These poor people are really, really having a hard time with the coronavirus. And I understand that. I wouldn't want to be in that little cabin for two weeks either. And he wasn't more than, more than in a cabin for two weeks. He was shipwrecked four times. Oh, well. In Acts 27, when he was shipwrecked with 276 other people, everybody was resigned to die except... Paul, and Paul prayed, and the Lord sent an angel, and, and he said, it's heard your prayer. Look at Acts 27. This is the grace of God. When they had gone a long time without food, Paul stood up in their midst and said, men, you ought to have followed my advice, not to have set sail from Crete and incurred this damage and loss. And yet I know, yet now I urge you to keep up your courage, for there will be no loss of life among you, but only the ship. How many men did it take on that ship to save the ship? One. It was the grace of God that he knew how to access. And I know we all think he was a perfect person, but please let me break it to you. I've been around many, many Christian leaders, including myself. There are no perfect people. From time to time, everybody messes up. And we don't want to think that, and we don't want to admit it to ourselves. There were times Paul messed up because Paul was human. Yeah. If you don't let a pastor be human, they don't want a pastor. Right. Because who, the, who tries, you know? Nobody's perfect. Yeah. For this very night, an angel of God whom I belong and whom I serve stood before me, saying, do not be afraid, Paul. You must stand before Caesar. Behold, God has granted you all those who are sealing with you. Hallelujah. Therefore, keep up your courage, man. I believe, God, that it will turn out exactly as I've been told. When you 
really know how to access the great grace of God, you will be the upbeat person that try that can keep the office on track when everybody's yeah. morose. Okay, but that's that's okay because that, you know how to access it. Yeah. Hebrews four sixteen. Then we're gonna just wrap this up really fast. <clears throat> Let us therefore come boldly. To what kind of throne? The throne of grace. When I got baptized in the Holy Spirit, I had totally the wrong image of God. And I'm glad they got me saved. I mean, I had totally. I was so scared to come to God. I was so desperate to ask to be filled. I'd never, I would not, I'd never heard anybody speak in tongues. I asked to be filled with the Spirit all by myself. And I was really kind of afraid. I knew I needed help, but I did not really know if I wanted to meet this God up close and personal. I was in college. And when he flooded me with his presence, when he filled the Spirit, that all you did flooded flooded me with. Do you have any idea how great he is? He's the throne of grace. He's... I've never met anybody like him. And I love you all to pieces. I've never met anybody like him. Because everybody has their limit. You just go, they're we're good with each other up until you cross that line. You'll find out what's in me. Hey, to admit it. Isn't that the truth, Crystal? Crystal and I will be the genuine people here. <laughs> Jesus. He sees everything. People see one little place where you messed up. I want to use a worse word and I won't. You messed up. And they say, well, I guess that disqualifies you from my friendship. And I went to Jesus that day. And I was scared. And I smiled for six months. I literally could not wipe the smile off my face for six months. He loves us. He doesn't just love us. He doesn't just feel sorry for us. He doesn't no. tolerate us. He doesn't say, well, you little scum down there, I'm going to let you to heaven because I feel so sorry for you. He's crazy. Yeah. He's crazy about you. God wants you to be able to have a good day when other people say, well, you should not qualify for a good day. Right. You've got six more six more months to do. Come on. And according to my schedule. Six months and then maybe you can have a good day. And you know what Jesus says? Oh, you you, you asked to forget you you asked to get forgiven? I'd have to check my book. I don't even know. Who ever heard of such a Right. Who ever heard of such a grace? Yeah. Now let me tell you something. If you really want to change people's lives, try to learn to operate in that kind of grace. Wow. He looks at you and he says, I see, I find no fault in you. Come on. Try treating people like that. Yeah. I love listening to testimonies of Jewish believers who have come to faith because I'm fascinated. How do we help them have revival? And every one to the one said, I had believers love me with a love that I didn't think was possible and that I had looked for all my life. And you say, oh, so you're asking me to go find a Jewish lost person and do that. Yes, but I'm also asking you to love your wife that way. You say, she does not deserve it. I knew that. The day in college when I stood in his presence, astounded, just astounded. I was explaining, I don't deserve it. They told me you wouldn't love me if I did this, this, and this. I did it all. You, I don't, and I knew he didn't care. Come on. I knew he didn't care how much I told him. He loves yes. me. Yeah. I don't care how many people are mad at you this morning. He loves you. Right. And you say, well, I just want to operate that kind of grace where you just reach out and get a miracle. I've had days where it just seemed like all you had to do was barely, you get the request halfway out of your mouth, there's the miracle. I've had days like that, but they're not like that. The one thing I figured out is that the days that go like that, when I start smiling and I can't wipe the smile off my face, is because I've shown somebody the grace of God they did not deserve. How do you block grace? By being proud. James says, humble yourself in the presence of the Lord and he will exalt you. God is opposed to the proud. Your head is proud. Which and you say, Pastor, what do you say? The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 8.1, it says, 
Knowledge puffs up, but love edifies. Knowledge is in your head thinks you can be everybody's judge. And that pride will keep you from grace. God is opposed to the proud, but gives grace to the humble. When you see somebody and they're not doing their most excellent job, you do not know what they've been through the last eight hours. Your head thinks you do. I know you can do better than you. What I'm trying to say is, he changed my life so completely. I've never known unconditional love in my life. To somebody lost me even when huh, it changed my life. You have the ability to change the people you are most frustrated with. Amen. Not by being their judge. Not by nagging them from the moment the sun rises to the after the sun sets. How many wives have ever figured out that nagging does not work? <laughs> well, okay. You say, why do you keep talking to us about that? Because God has a higher level of joy for us. And it's a place where you let people be forgiven and you treat them forgiven and you treat you like you're forgiven. You agree with the Word of God. Hallelujah. First Peter, let's just read that chapter. We've got five minutes. Read that um. James 4, because it's just so clear. I mean, you couldn't understand this. You adulteresses, do you not know that friendship with the world is hostility toward God? Isn't that interesting? You have to be a saint just to, to be an enemy of God. No. This says hostility. The other translations say enemy. You just have to be a friend of the world to be an enemy of God. Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Or do you think that the scripture speaks for no purpose? He jealously desires the spirit which he has made to dwell in us. Translators have fought over that and agonized over that verse. But the bottom line is one way or the other, however you translate it, the Holy Spirit is jealous for you. The Holy, if, if you really want a bunch of grace in your life, just tell God frequently how much you appreciate it, how much you love him. Now, if you get that close to him, he's going to make you be nicer to people. How many of you have ever found out that it, Please, it's him for you to be nice to people. Okay, their, their life's hard enough. Do you know? Okay, next verse back. But he gets a greater grace. Okay, is that what we're after? Anybody but me here after a greater grace? There, okay. Therefore, it says, God is opposed to the proud of his grace, to so the humble. Submit, therefore, to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. So, I mean, when you have an argument, and I'm not saying you will, but there's... If you're married another 30 years, there's a possibility. Humble <laughs> <laughs> uh, yourself. Say, you know what? That was my fault. That's yeah, 100% my fault. I ask you to forgive me. What if they don't forgive you? You treat them like, like they've forgiven you. You treat them like you've forgiven them. You treat them the way God treats them. And that's what the extraordinary grace <coughs> We, we read in Psalm 46.1 that God is abundantly available for help in high places. I just want to wrap it up with this. Wednesday night we talked about the fact that we are not to see each other. If you see all your spouses or all your kids' faults and that's all you see, it's really hard to lavish grace on them in their worst moments. I'm sure you don't know that. Anybody know that? But you know, the Apostle Paul when he was very first saved, and we went and read it Wednesday night, we don't have time now, but Acts chapter 9, he gets saved, and he gets gloriously saved. Their scales falls from his eyes, he gets filled with the Spirit, starts speaking in tongues, he gets called to the ministry, and he goes up and he starts preaching. You know what the problem was? Those Christians would have nothing to do with it. Nothing. Until finally one man, gave Barnabas, put his arm around him, and said, let me tell you what happened to Brother Paul, Saul, they call him Saul, Brother Saul. He told him about how he got saved and how he has a revelation and how he's been refuting the Jews and explaining that he's one man. Whoa. I honestly believe that if, if, if the way things were going, we could have been robbed of our New Testament. Bridget. Because people said, well, I know him. He killed Greek Aunt Elsa's husband by throwing him in that prison. He had a heart attack and died. There's people, they will never let you go. You love them and stay out of their way. But you and I have got to believe that the blood of Jesus does everything the Word of God says the blood of Jesus does. Now, when you come under the blood, it doesn't take him 15 years to forgive you or cleanse you. When you come under the blood, well, that did that. Now, what are we going to do next? And you say, you can't treat yourself like that. That's how God treats me. Amen. That's how the Word treats me. 
That's how you have to treat other people. And you, I can hear it. You say, but they don't deserve it. Darling, would you like what you deserve this morning? Oh, really? Come on up, we'll give you what you <laughs> Okay, then if you don't want what you deserve, how about giving your worst enemy, otherwise known as? Sometimes we're madder at our spouse than we are Osama bin Laden, you know? Because the trouble is, it's up close and personal. Just decide, you know what? Extravagant grace is something I'd like to know about. First John 1 7 says, We walk in the light, as he himself is in the light. We have fellowship with one another. The blood of Jesus' his Son continually cleanses. In the Greek, continually. Would you pull out that one verse? For, yeah, read it with me. But if we walk in the light. How many of you are here this morning because you're trying to walk in the light? You walk in the light. Okay. But if we walk in the light, as he himself is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. Why? Because the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. Yeah, Gabriella, come on up here. I don't know what I'm going to say, but you don't do anything wrong. You're so cute. You're like Christina. Nobody in the world will ever get mad at you. Okay. So if we're walking in the light, and we wanted hard enough to find something wrong with each other, could we? Yeah, yeah, we could. I'm glad you got that right. Okay. But I want to know something. If we're walking... And I'm loving Jesus, and you're loving Jesus, and you're pursuing the will of God, and I'm pursuing the will of God. What is it? It says we have fellowship with one another. Well, how can we have fellowship with one another if we could pick at each other? You know why? It's on that last verse. Because the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. You are going to have to look at the people that have frustrated you. Thank you. I just thought it might make it easier, and they all enjoy seeing you. Um, you're going to have to look at the people that frustrate you. If they have 10-year-old sins on your record, you've got a problem. You see, how do you dare say that? You don't know what they did. There is nothing that you've got to forgive anybody for worse than what Jesus has forgiven. He does not come up and get a council of angels to see whether to forgive you. You expect, how many of you expect instantaneous forgiveness? Be honest. You expect instantaneous forgiveness. Then let me ask you something. Why don't you offer it? How many of you expect extravagant grace? You go to the Lord and He just, oh, like a grandfather, loves you. Yeah. You can't expect it unless you're going to dish it up. Yeah. This is the year of extravagant grace. Be extravagantly good to your kids, extravagantly good to your husband or wife. I want to tell you, if somebody lost a husband, you would appreciate them. If they died, you, you would be sobbing here with me trying to help you. How many of you have a great spouse? Raise your hand if you're married. Out of everybody, 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 everybody. The grace of God flows where we let it flow. And we're supposed to, this is one of those years, we just take, take the holds off. You don't nag anymore. Picking at each other is anathema. Picking at each other is of Satan. And it, all it is is just a little kindling. Like, it's hard to start a fire, but you get some straw, some real dry straw. All you got to have is one, you know, get a magnifying glass. You can set that on fire in the sun, you know? That's what picking is. Just, I don't think we should turn there. I think we should turn there. I almost destroyed my marriage, and I didn't have a sense of direction. I kind of just shut up. And it takes 10 hours to get there to save your marriage. This is before the days of GPS. God bless whoever came up with GPS. All right, I'm done. It is 1201. How many of you have been recipients of extravagant? I mean, extravagant. How many could you could give us some out? Thank you.